Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us here today. I'm Robert Smith. I am humbled and honored to be here amongst this distinguished panel. Uh, I come to you as an investor, an inventor, an entrepreneur, and a businessman to focus on one of the key areas of our economy, which is really the digital context. Our panel called the New Digital Context will focus on four specific areas. The first is the digital economy, the Internet of Things, big data, and part of big data, of course, is predictive analytics and cybersecurity, something that's very important and that we are all facing and dealing with daily. As a narrator, I will first introduce our cast of characters and then set the stage for a larger discussion. <laughs> And each of these panel members will then be asked a question where they can actually express their views and perspectives on this digital economy in the new digital context. We will then go to a series of pointed questions that I will ask each of the, of the, of the panelists, and hopefully we'll have a chance to have some interaction from that. After that context, what we'll do then is then have an open discussion and have a few questions, hopefully 15 or 20 minutes in discussion. So first, let's start with our cast. To my right, we have the architect, Mr. John Chambers, who's the chairman and CEO of Cisco Systems. During his 20 years there, he has effectively pushed over a half a trillion dollars of networking equipment into the marketplace. He has created this backbone, this infrastructure that we now all rely on. And it's kind of an interesting dynamic in terms of this technology-enabled world. As we were talking earlier, he is even more excited about the future than he is of the past. And thank you, John, for leading the way. It's fun to be here, Robert. Great. Thank you. Next, we have the Empowerer. <laughs> <laughs> he is a knight, from what I understand, Pierre Natrami. So Pierre, during his tenure at Accenture, has now pushed over a quarter trillion dollars of services <laughs> in stitching together and putting together the context of this digital economy so that businesses and governments can actually effectively change their, 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 their paradigms. Pierre operates in over, I think, with over, in over 40 industries, over 120 countries. We're excited that he's here and excited the good work that they do. Thank the, you, and you could call me Pierre, not Knight Pierre. Oh, Knight Pierre, okay, that's what you told me earlier. <laughs> we also now have the transformer, Dr. Lou Jiren. Now, Lou has a very interesting dynamic. He is in China. He's created a company called NewSoft, which has actually transformed a number of industries within China. Everything from the telecommunications industry, healthcare, and, and the financial services and insurance. And we're quite interested to hear how his country and how he is actually transforming those businesses. One of the more interesting elements, he stood up a university, a free university. 30,000 students participate in a university. They've started hundreds of companies, and they are focused on digitizing parts of the economy. So quite interesting. Dr. Liu, we are happy to have you here today. Thank you. And lastly, we have the disruptor, Mr. <laughs> Max Levshin. Now, one thing about Max is he is an impatient individual, from what I understand. He was in college. He found out that the more data he put into the systems, the slower it became. So rather than call the IT help desk like all of us usually do, he decided to then evaluate structured, unstructured data sets, come up with his own cryptography, and develop a little company called PayPal, and then a little company called Yelp. So we're excited to hear him and talk about what his perspectives are in the role of the disruptor. I have to thank you on behalf of all the entrepreneurs out there because your guiding spirit is the thing that I think keeps this economy exciting and this world a fun place to participate. Thank you. And finally, I get to be what I call the evolved narr involved narrator. I run a private equity firm. We involve ourselves in, in enterprise software. We've now done over 150 transactions. We're about the seventh or eighth largest enterprise software company on the planet, and we have a lot of fun in the front row seat, looking at these fantastic participants do their thing. So it's quite exciting to be here, and thank you all for joining us. Let's set the stage. Today, we can convey ideas across the planet reliably with certainty because of the greatest invention in the world, no, it's not a router, is quantum mechanics. And when I think about that, and what it has actually done to transform our economy to become a digital com uh, economy, computers, mobile devices, they're interoperable at this point, and it is clear that every single business is now a technology business. And the value that's created is based on the technology platforms and the technology that they run. So to give you a perspective from, from that I see, in the enterprise software world, seven years ago, there were about, call it, you know, 25 to 30,000 enterprise software companies with $1.7 trillion in market cap. Today, there are over 50,000. 
with over two trillion, and the expectations in the next five years will be well over 75,000 with over three trillion. So the market is expanding and creating value all along the way, and it's quite exciting. Every company is a technology company. When you start to think about it, if you don't transform, you, your industry will be transformed. We think about a world where the largest taxi company in the world doesn't own a vehicle. The largest bookseller doesn't actually have a bookshelf. The largest hotelier actually doesn't have to worry about turn down service nor take a dollar of inventory on those little bars of soap. So you think about how these disruptors have come in and changed our world. And our panelists will increasingly share parts of their experience, not only today, but throughout this, this forum, to talk about what you have to do as a business leader in order to ensure that you are the disruptors in your industry rather than being disrupted. Now we talk about the Internet of Things, and as my friend Mr. Chambers talks about, John talks about the, <laughs> the Internet of Everything. Yeah. It's quite interesting how many devices are connected today and to what extent billions, 20, 30, 50 billion, I hear, devices will be connected in the next 10 years. Now the dynamic, of course, that creates a mountain of data. And that mountain of data has to be used responsibly. Max, what Max does is he convinces us Give us some information. And we give him information. He makes our life more convenient. He makes our life uh, more pleasant. And then he starts to give me things that I didn't know I wanted, and I start to buy them. But he has a responsibility, of course, because now he has my data. And when that data all of a sudden becomes part of a target, then we have a problem. You all know in the last few years, from what we understand, at least in America with J.P. Morgan and many of the retailers, over 250 million accounts and information with J.P. Morgan, Target, Home Depot, et cetera, were breached. The public school math basically says that's about 50 million to 90 million individuals whose information has now been put out in the marketplace. There is now a responsibility that we have, business leaders and entrepreneurs, to protect that data. That's one of the other topics we want to spend time on. So with that, what I really want to do is now turn to John. John, tell us what you're seeing. Tell us about the dialogue and the conversations you're having with executives. How are they facing these challenges? And most importantly, how are you going to help them face these challenges? Please. So, Robert, keying off what you said and kind of uh, laying the architecture for where the conversation may go, the Internet of Everything and every country becoming a technology country, every company becoming a digital company, was something we started talking about eight years ago. Nobody wanted to hear. Right. You had to buy drinks here at Davos <laughs> to get people to focus on it. However, I've seen this movie before. Today, what has happened, you're at an inflection point. Take what happened during the 90s with the internet, multiply it by five to tenfold, and that's what you're about to see effect on society, economic benefits, and can lead value to every person on a global basis. Economically, it's probably a $19 trillion cost saving and profit opportunity in the next 10 years. Uh, 4.6 trillion of that is in government, half of that in cities, and then it goes across every industry from manufacturing all the way to insurance. In short, what you're going to see is every company, every country, every citizen, every home, every car, every wearable becomes digital, and that information flow is going to allow you to change things that will change our lives, change the effectiveness of business, disrupts the winners from the losers, and it is about fast innovation in this new world. If you don't innovate fast, disrupt your industry, disrupt yourself, you get left behind. What it will be is a series of firsts in terms of what this can do, getting the right information at the right time to the right person so the right machine or person can make the right decision. But what you will also see is probably 40% of the enterprise business does not survive for the next decade. Wow. You will see basically companies who fail to get the market transition right, left behind. Mm -hmm. You'll see companies who do the right thing for too long, i.e. stay with your core capabilities and don't disrupt yourself and move into new areas. And finally, companies who don't reinvent themselves. So you're really talking about a period of rapid change. You're talking about one that will change society for the benefit and kind of closing out the conversation going back to the key takeaway. That's the U.S. economy for one year spread around the world. Wow. So it's benefit and opportunity is huge to society, but it does take an architecture. Think digital first. Think Internet of Everything with all the market transitions of cloud and security and everything underneath that and mobility. 
and then think about fast innovation enabled by fast IT. That's helpful. Pierre, would you talk a little bit about the dialogue, the discussion you're having with your customers in helping them on that transition? People here are interested in the future. They want to understand how you do it. How do you frame it? How do you actually enable them to be successful and protect their data? Yes, absolutely, Robert. And of course, very pleased to be here. Uh, we used to say at Accenture that every business is a digital business, very much uh, similar to what uh, John uh, just, uh, just said. And simply said, 100% of my uh, discussion with CEOs will be around digitalization and rationalization. And sometimes digitalization could play a role in rationalization of the operation and the cost. But as well, digitalization is enabling new businesses, 100%. If I'm just looking at the business we have at Accenture, uh, over six years, uh, we built a digital business of $5 billion, which is almost the same size of the business in ERP, uh, Enterprise Resource Management Process. We built over 25 years. 25 years, five years, similar size of business. It's just absolutely uh, amazing. Discussion with the CEOs, uh, it's happening by waves, if you will. We had the first wave of digital consumer, mm -hmm. much more for the B2C kind of uh, uh, organization and companies, and we move to the digital enterprise. Uh, you reinvent the processes of the organization and make them more effective. And now, as John is mentioning and alluded already, we are moving to the digital operations, uh, the internet of things, the internet of everything, the industry of internet, whatever the name is, which is putting the internet at the heart of the operation and connecting the world and connecting the information. So it's happening by wave, first the B2C businesses, second the B2B will be now significantly impacted, especially with the internet of everything. First, of course, the commercial uh, business okay. and now uh, the governments uh, which are putting their act together. Uh, so it's really uh, prominent in terms of the agenda. And finally, talking with the CEOs, if I had to frame the issues right. or the challenges, the mm -hmm. big questions, probably around five uh, I would mention. One is around the digital strategy. Interestingly, 80% of the CEOs I'm talking with, um, based on our survey, uh, uh, would claim that they understand uh, the internet of everything will be disruptive. Only seven will have a plan. Wow. Uh, second yeah. would be the digital organization within the company that I'm sure yeah, there are going to be many questions on how I organize digital. Is it part of the core? Is it a dedicated organization? Mm -hmm. Both. So a lot of discussions around how you organize digital to roll out efficiently uh, digital within the organization. Three, and it's a profound evolution for the organization, is how you do execute mm -hmm. uh, uh, with the ecosystem. And you will see a lot of discussion around partnership, around ecosystem management. Uh, uh, to enable the digital, it's more than one company could do. Uh, and we need to partner between us and between us and, and with our clients. Uh, that would be my, uh, my point uh, uh, number three. Four, skills, skills, skills. We talk about big data. Right. Right. Uh, to enable big data, we understand what you need to have to do, but then you need business scientists. You need to drive algorithm of the future. You need this new generation of, uh, of skills, and only 40% of our clients believe uh, they, would have the, they believe they will never get to the right skills and we will have to build them probably around the university. And finally, security, 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 right. and security. It has now become an agenda for the board or for the uh, managing uh, uh, directors, if you will, uh, which is extremely prominent around all you know, the data privacy, data security, uh, data integrity, but as well the famous uh, uh, internet governance uh, we might uh, talk about, uh, which is probably uh, one of the most complex uh, topic uh, uh, the society will have to face in the coming three years. Right, that, that's great. Hey, Max, what, what I want to talk about is, you know, th these gentlemen talk about the businesses that they're advising going through these transitions. Of course, during the transitions and the waves of transitions, there are gaps and there are opportunities. Tell us a little bit through your lens of how entrepreneurs and how companies are taking advantage of those gaps and opportunities and what are they doing differently that enables them to create billion dollar, multi-billion dollar companies in, in times measured in half a decade as opposed to multi-decades. Right, so I think this is the most exciting time in history as far as uh, nerds like me are concerned because finally data that used to be a morphed construct is now essentially a currency. You can think of data either as a currency and you can think of data exchange rates or as a commodity, which is the way I prefer to think about it. So John's putting all these devices out there. They each sit there and talk to each other best way I found to think about them are as sensors. They're generating this incredible amount of data that they pick up from the analog processes mm -hmm. as they transition to digital. 
They're bringing that into the center of the cloud and things like cloud computing essentially create an opportunity to build entirely new kinds of services where the centralized coordination enables efficient utilization of resources at the edge. The interesting thing about traditional companies versus the disruptors is traditional companies already have mountains of data and mm -hmm. there's a lot to lose by misusing, exposing the data, doing something with it that it wasn't meant to do. On the other hand, disruptors, like yours truly, have nothing to lose. So as we look at the data that comes off from the edge, we have an opportunity to build entirely new businesses. Mm -hmm. As the data reaches critical mass, and this is true for both small companies and large companies, you have essentially a naturally forming network effect of data. The person or the company at the center of the cloud knows a lot more about any one participant at the edge than any other participant does. So they effectively become a data monopoly. The concept yeah. of a data monopoly is going to be absolutely dominant for the next 10, 20, 30 years. The industries that are getting disrupted the most are the ones that relied on a point-to-point -point data monopoly. The last ones to go down and get completely rewritten will be healthcare because the data regulation made it very, very hard to change things. But now that every thermometer is going to be network connected, it's going to be completely different. Mm -hmm. And finance, where data was always thought of as a currency, but it was confined to a very small number of people. The, the company that is today a lot like what the future looks like for many finance companies is Bloomberg. They've built a natural network effect driven, effectively data store where they know everything about everyone using the data at the edge more than they do. So there's just an incredible number of opportunities, primarily stemming from the fact that data is aggregated at rates so high and the value at, with this aggregated data is growing exponentially. The biggest challenge for most companies out there is gonna be figuring out how to store this data in a way that doesn't expose them to security breaches, liability, having to deal with upset customers, being able to say, here, look at my data source, my data vault. It is encrypted in a way that is better for my customers and for my partners than if they kept it themselves. That is the only barrier they have to clear before they have a chance to survive. Good, so I wanna get back to that data point because that's an important one and I think we, I wanna get some perspectives from, from John and Pierre. But Dr. Liu, I think one of the interesting elements of your business is that you take an approach where you can actually, if you think about it, transform entire industries within your country with Newsoft and the way that you're approaching it. I think it'd be helpful, yeah, many may not know that he was the first PhD of China to actually get a PhD in computer engineering. So it was well ahead of the curve and is taking that technology and that insight back to actually help drive transformational change in existing companies or existing industries there. If you wouldn't mind, please give us a perspective of what you're seeing and what you're doing actually in China so that everyone <coughs> understands what's coming. Okay, thank you. So uh, if you look at uh, the, the past 30 years of China, so a lot of people talking about the driver is a capital, driver is a low cost, but I, I, I want to say uh, one of the driver is IT. And I start my business in uh, 24 years ago, uh, in, uh, in starting from a campus of university. I'm so lucky because when I started the business the first day, China starting have a mobile phone, mm -hmm. a telephone. Mm -hmm. In that time, China is very hard to get a fixed phone. You must take a very long line to waiting to get this opportunity. But in just a few years, the mobile phone got popular that is because not only hardware like Cisco and so many telecom companies come to China, also excellent software. So we are becoming a software provider to billing, to custom care and management of this. And then, you know, because we make a transformation of state-owned enterprises, right. a lot of people lose job. The government tried to build a kind of infrastructure for social security. So it's starting to develop software for insurance for healthcare, unemployment, unemployment. So everything, so we uh, just spend around six years, so the given every people a kind of insurance. So that great help to government to make a big transformation from state owned, uh, the most of business become a more and more uh, private, uh, the business coming. Mm -hmm. And then we say the facility, the building, uh, e-commerce. I think China is uh, lucky in past 30 years, not only build a kind of infrastructure like a highway power, they build the IT infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So now if you look at around 400 million people is internet user, 
almost uh, 50 percent. Yeah. Uh, that the people population uses the internet. Around 500 million people use a smartphone. Mm -hmm. And around uh, 300 million people use a mobile phone to buy something. So a lot of people, the e-bank is become so popular. Young people, especially young generation, right. they're doing everything on the mobile phone. Mm -hmm. Today, the millions of young people start up their business. They're, they're, uh, they try to make uh, their own business by apps. A lot of people develop the apps, make a so success. So I think uh, the internet IT infrastructure is not only digitalized uh, enterprises or government, and also that become a kind of plan platform offer the jobs, right. especially for young generation in the next 10 or 20 years. So like uh, you know, we own three university, mm -hmm. around 30,000 students study in our university. They learn the internet, uh, software. So we provide a kind of platform like student to start up their business based on our platform. Now every year around, around few hundred students and they build their company, they have CEO, CTO. They're working together, 20 people, 30 people. They start up their business. After four years study in university, they can have their own real the business and after graduate from university. I think uh, so the, the change, change of the China is uh, one of a big, very big the drive is because uh, you know, we totally adapt the new technology, especially digital, mm -hmm. everything. The manufacturing is very, very important. If you look at it in China, why? They can move fast, they can have uh, very high productivity, a lot of uh, you know, investment for IT. Right. I'm going to get back to the, to the comment about the uh, skills, training in the university in a minute, but I want to actually direct this to Pierre and John to talk a little bit about the experience you're having with government and enterprises. Tell us a little bit about what you're seeing globally. How, who are you seeing is on the forefront? What's the amount of spending that you're seeing? Are, there, are, are governments embracing a new digital economy? Pierre, you want to take that first, and John, you want to come in uh, after? Yeah, sure, uh, Robert. I mean, when, when, when you look at this, again, everybody's talking about going digital. Uh, now, uh, you have different pace uh, when you look around the world. Uh, fact of the matter is some of the new markets, emerging markets, or, uh, are, are moving faster. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm thinking, I, I'm fascinated, for instance, at a, a place such as Singapore has been moving digital uh, everywhere. Uh, digital health, digital security, digital safety, uh, and so forth. So almost everything in digital. At the same time, in some places in Europe, we're still planning uh, for a digital big plan mm -hmm. at the, for instance, uh, European level. We are making some steps, but some are still planning when some are uh, already uh, executing. Right. Of course, when you look at from a government standpoint, uh, you will have all sorts of initiative around creating the single point of contact, uh, a, a kind of digital website so the citizen can interact uh, with the government. And again, this is wave one. Right. Uh, the point for the government is to move to really an e-government kind of organization, e-cities, and then e-countries. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are more in the e-citizen, if you will, in the first wave. And of course, uh, some of the countries are already built if you think of Japan, if you think of Korea, some of the countries are already built based on digital. So are digital uh, native. So you can see some steps by government, but I guess a lot, a lot uh, to be done. And at the heart of this digital evolution in the government will be the digital regulation. Because right. in order to enable digital at government, we will have, and government will have to go through uh, the kind of digital regulation uh, they, they, need, they need to get. It's very different from the commercial business. As mm -hmm. I mentioned with the commercial business, B2C is super hot. Right. Now the big game is more around the B2B business, mm -hmm. uh, including the manufacturing, uh, the oil and gas. I'm uh, uh, fascinating to see that recently, probably something we wouldn't have been doing even five years ago, we're creating a joint venture with General Electric, right. Accenture General Electric, to provide pipeline uh, analytic services. So again, you can see all this wave 
coming now in the manufacturing Creating place. tremendous amount of data again. John, you talk to heads of state every day, mm -hmm. and what are their concerns? How are they thinking about the digital economy? How do they think about the opportunity, and how do they actually evaluate the threats associated with, the, with that transformation? It, it's been surprising how much that's changed in the last 12 months. Israel is probably the first digital country in the world. Their leadership, whether Shimon Perez or Prime Minister Netanyahu, the third party, the finance side, they digitized their country because they were after GDP growth. They were after job creation. They were after inclusion of minorities, the Arabs and the Orthodox Jewish population. They wanted to bring education through broadband to every home. Mm -hmm. They wanted to change health care dramatically so every person had access to health care. They wanted a new generation of innovation as they did it. They wanted smart, secure cities, et cetera. That's exactly what Merkel's doing in Germany. You talk about a developed country that has its act together. Their industrial Ford Auto, Deutsche Telekom saying where I was yesterday, mm -hmm. how they're going to play a key role in really changing the economy, how they're going to take their manufacturing base and become much more competitive on a global <laughs> basis. France, if you want a wild card, uh, I'm going to bet on France. I believe that MEDEF, their uh, business group, the young startups really get it. Uh, at CES just a uh, week ago, there were 70 startups from France, wow. uh, half of them around the internet of everything. Mm -hmm. They won 14 of the top uh, entrepreneurial prizes, and half of those they won best in class in show. And you get a government who's going to change and willing to create, I think, a more positive environment for a million jobs that I think MEDEF would deliver on, their equivalent of Chamber of Commerce. So you're seeing government leaders get it. Cities, if you want to go to a city of the future, go to Barcelona hmm. or Hamburg or Chicago. They realize how it's going to change jobs in their cities, how it's going to change transport, deliver on civil services, et cetera. But the key is you've got to bring these together in ways that make sense. Healthcare in a way that you deliver it. Chronic care alone is a $146 billion opportunity. China has its act together on how they share the doctors, mm -hmm. nurses on a global basis. Pierre hit it earlier. If you're going to do a city or a country, you've got to have partnerships that didn't work before at a different level. One of the winners and losers will be determined by how tightly in a century and a Cisco, for example, can work together to help deliver on the capabilities. And the same thing with the business leaders. They get it. They realize they have to be the disruptors. And this is why you've got to have people like Max around you. I spend more time around entrepreneurs now than I ever have. You can tell I'm dressing like them again. And uh, they think exponentially. We in traditional business think linearly. And exponential thinking causes you to go at a problem differently. It's, it, you set audacious goals. You, you people I hang out with, you know, and to really help teach my leadership team, uh, an Aaron Levy from a box, or uh, Patrick uh, Collinson, who you know well from Stripe, uh, a PayPal follow-on, if you will. Mm -hmm. And these all come together in ways that will change economies and change the world in a very exciting way. Mm -hmm. And I think every country, it's a free-for-all, right. which means everyone can benefit from it, but countries or companies who don't disrupt will get disrupted and left behind. Let's talk about the winners and losers as it relates to the, to the people, because I think the important thing is it is a people business. It is yes, a yes, smart yes. person business. How do you train them? How do you develop them? Max, you're around these people all the time. You inspire them. Tell us about the types of entrepreneurs you're seeing. Tell us what, you, what you're looking for, and tell us the types of things that they are focused on. Data, you know, how do they use data? How do they create uh, businesses out of data in a way that can help the audience understand what to look for in, in the businesses or the governments that they're operating in? So there's a tremendous amount of entrepreneurship happening in California. So this is my only chance to look like this. Unlike John, I don't have to wear a suit most of the time. So uh, I spend most of my time in California. It's where, a nice tie, by the way. Well, thank you. It's the first time I've ever tied it up. I bet. Who will be French? Yes. Um, so it, it's a great time to be in California. It's a great time to be in America because entrepreneurship is very much booming. The variety of entrepreneurs that exist today, sort of very hard to cover. The ones that I'm most interested in, the ones that I really care to associate myself with, and I invite everyone who has a company that needs to survive in the age of disruption, find people that are thinking 100 years out. There are whole special subclass of these people that don't look for an IPO, they don't look for an acquisition. They're mm -hmm. thinking 100 years from now, this company will still have my name on a door or whatever the name is, that's what is gonna stick around. And typically what they're thinking about despite the unpopular world, is a, a worth is a creation of a natural monopoly, something that sticks around for so long because its customers do not want it to go out of business. The typical skill set, the typical mindset that I look for in these people is really figuring out something that the customer wants in a way that inspires them or pushes them to have it built by someone else. 
whether it's a consumer business or a for business business, there's always the notion of this will forever be cheaper, this will forever be better if my partner produces it for me. So these are the most interesting kind of businesses. That is naturally expressed in this whole cloud computing, which and I'm very excited about, that you mentioned Uber. Mm -hmm. Uber is a kind of a cloud computing company. It's a company that replaced humans in the cloud, the dispatchers, with computers. And it's fascinating because, again, of the security implications. The thing that, again, is seen in this whole new crop of entrepreneurs, they say, I can't allow a data disruption right. to put me out of business in six months. I have to survive 100 years or more. So what they're doing is they're designing with mind of a customer in, in mind, it was security from the ground up. Longevity of their business, longevity of their concepts, strong set of values that is meant to stay around for a very long time. Those are all values that, that define a long-term entrepreneur. Max, can I ask a question? Because one of the struggles we have is companies have to reinvent themselves every three to five years in today's world. Yep. And you were able to reinvent your company multiple times. How do you get that into the young entrepreneurs? Because usually what happens is they stay with the right thing for too long and they don't reinvent themselves. And that's why probably 90% of the startups end up crashing and burning within 10 years. How did you change it and what kind of the lessons learned, not just for startups, but for all of us in this room? If that's okay. No, that's perfect. I, I suspect paranoia has a lot to do with I'm it. As we go and learn. <laughs> uh, I, I think uh, most of the time you find Guys like me waking up in the middle of the night and saying, I don't know yet, something's going to hit me. I, I don't know what it is, but I, I got to sit around and plan for the disruption. And the only right answer to that fear is to ask the question, what would I do? If I were to be the other guy ready to disrupt Max, ready to put him out of business, what would I do? Mm -hmm. And if you paint that picture for yourself, you can go into the office and paint it for your employees. And you freak them out a little, but by the end of the day, they have a plan to disrupt themselves. And then whoever's plotting to put you out of business, you're putting them out of business because before they even get a plan together. That's a great point. Uh, Dr. Liu, I, one of the things I think you've done extremely well is find that talent. How do you, tell us a little bit about your university. Tell us a little bit about how you're developing, cultivating the types of businesses that are coming from that so that we can all learn. You know, you're training 30,000 people a year. And I'm assuming you're, 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 you're continuing that, that university where certain businesses are training a few hundred a year. So tell us about how you get to that scale and okay. governments you need to get to tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of year, uh, a year in training young people and, and, and entrepreneurs in that context. You know, on my background, I, I was a professor. I, uh, I found this uh, in White Falls Street University just uh, because I was a professor. I haven't uh, exactly working for a university for so long time, and then after I have money, I try to to you know build a university to use my own way mm -hmm. to develop talents. So I think uh, that the basically today education landscape is a big change. So the very much beyond of uh, campus, uh, learning the teacher professor is uh, like an integrator of education resources. Mm -hmm. He cannot uh, deliver the skill anymore because the student no more than professor now. And uh, they must be integrate everything the, together from outside and to give uh, you know, very much interactive the opportunity like student to dialogue with the professor. So for those kind of purpose in our university, I give them a name called student office, venture office. So we spend the biggest, uh, you know, the space like student can start up their own business. They can simulate a kind of a real company after they learn the marketing, sales, organization, or business uh, management, everything they can simulate, we can give him some money, like him to simulate how to booking, how to make a balance sale, how to make uh, mm -hmm. even uh, the brand or something. So I think it's uh, exactly you can find, uh, just like uh, I found my company in campus of university, all employee is my student. In that time I was mm -hmm. professor. Mm -hmm. So I say a lot of young people they can got a more big opportunity than my time in the past. Right. So if you look at uh, the education now, I can give you one of the example is uh, China for healthcare. You know, it's a big reform now is because most of best doctor in big city, in best hospital. So if you look at second tier city, in China second tier city means a six million population. Right. Mm -hmm. And then rural areas, small town, it's like a quarter of a million people in there. They have a very big gap. The, the, they are not equal to access 
the healthcare, the services. And then we build a kind of platform. So like a rural areas doctor, I call him a barefoot doctor. Mm -hmm. They have no medical degree, right. but they are already starting to, to care about people. Sure. So how to like him to learn from a best doctor in big city? So how to like the knowledge of the best experience of the doctor can be delivered by a network mm -hmm. to the rural areas doctor. And that's real time, it's a real time delivery real of information. Time, right. Most important is data. Right. So remote diagnostic without data, without full data, is right. not only blood pressure, single data. Mm -hmm. So then we connect few thousands, you know, around you know, 10,000 small village, yep. and together with a few hundred big hospital. And then we share a big database, like uh, each of person have a personal healthcare record, and they can share it by all group doctor. I call, that is coordinate medicine but that is a real learning environment. It's teaching each other, the sharing knowledge. I think that is a new platform, new way to learn. Makes sense. Pierre, you have some comments on that, and I have a question for you about big data. You know, I hear a lot of executives talk about we have mountains of data, we, it's not actionable today. Talk a little, little bit about that as you address uh, Dr. Liu's. Uh, Absolutely, and then I would like to yeah. uh, build on what uh, Dr. Liu mentioned to us, but just on big data, two data. <laughs> Uh, on this, we just just tracking based on the recent survey we uh, we, we convened. First, 79 percent of the respondents to the survey believe that uh, if you're not able to embrace big data, your industry uh, will face your company will face extinction. Right. To that level, second data only 40 percent already already uh, already 40 percent believe they don't have the talent, mm -hmm. and I guess it's underestimated. So you just imagine if you're putting that together, 80 percent would believe. I need the big data right. and I don't have the talent and I would face extinction. Mm -hmm. So all of this is so critical Then indeed the talent agenda, as mentioned by Dr. Liu, is absolutely uh, uh, paramount. And you remember this last couple of years here in Davos, yeah. we talked a lot around STEM, yes, uh, education, STEM, I mean science, technology, engineering, math, all the different countries. If we want to provide employment in the future, we need to pivot education to more STEM. When you look in STEM, analytics, Right. will be even more uh, critical because this is where we need more talent to drive the algorithm, to do the mining, to do the big data. Some could be sophisticated and where you, we need PhD. Some would be less sophisticated and, and, and you might need just uh, a good people. Uh, this last couple of years, we hired a thousand PhDs mm -hmm. uh, to drive algorithm and we feel we are extremely <laughs> short. So we had a very consistent with what you said, uh, Doctor, uh, to create a partnership, for instance, with MIT. We are creating with uh, uh, universities many partnerships around the world to create to create the education. Right. And when I'm talking with many companies, they all, uh, likewise you're doing, starting to think about creating their own curriculum around creating partnership to creating the kind of education the public sector is not providing. Again, a good illustration where private could, moving forward, collaborate with the public to create the education of the future as we speak, hundreds of thousand jobs right. could be created in Europe, uh, as you mentioned, John, with your okay. visit in Europe, okay. around uh, analytics. And I know this is a place where unemployment is very high. Right. So all this big data is source for growth, is source for employment, and you have a kind of virtue cycle here. Scarcity of talent. We have the scarcity of places to educate them. We have to create that opportunity set. I know our president has said he wants to create education free at the, at the I'll call it the community college level, but part of that has to be driven towards some sort of technology STEM related uh, activities in order for it to be productive for us. Max, I have a question for you. Big data, the back edge of the sword, talk about it. How do you actually protect it? How do you ensure that you're actually not you know, violating the trust that you have with, with your customers or violating the trust, uh, the government violating the trust with, 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 their, with their citizens? I actually have a, I'll, I'll answer that in a second, but uh, I have one comment on Dr. Wu's point. The, the barefoot doctor image really resonates with me vis-a-vis -vis data. So one of the sort of a little bit off the wall, but one of the technologies that I'm super excited about is augmented reality. The uh, Google Glass has just announced they're going to go and retool themselves, and that's a temporary setback. Ultimately, the barefoot doctor in China will wear AR device, either Google Glass or something directly in his brain, and without a medical degree, a giant database of information in the cloud will tell him, that's not a bruise, that's something much worse. Go get antibiotics. You don't need a medical degree 
to execute a simple shot on someone if you have the precise data. Moreover, you'll have real-time communication with real medical doctors somewhere in Beijing where the best universities are. That's what the future of big data really looks like, between communications and sensors at the ground mm -hmm. and distribution of skills at the very edges of the network. Having said that, it and is I'm sure maybe, Matt, you might add uh, augmented reality together with cognitive computing. Uh, absolutely. The, the, it is the most exciting time to be alive, but I'm sure every entrepreneur <laughs> thinks that. <Yeah>. But uh, <laughs> on, on the other side of that is, of course, the fact that you know, between HIPAA compliance and, in, in my country and uh, just the basic idea of privacy, particularly popular in Europe at the moment, there's a lot of potholes in the landmines. The only answer I know, and this is my background, that's what I studied, that's what I love, you have to start with security in mind. You have to design with cryptography built in from the ground up. The basic idea I teach to every person who joins any one of my companies that has to do anything with data, imagine a one-sided membrane. Data outside, it's not your problem. As soon as data rolls through the membrane that you control, it is encrypted, it is protected, and it is never to be unwrapped, unencrypted, unless you must compute on it, unless you must make a conclusion. As soon as you're done, wipe it out, only store the data encrypted. One more practical advice, if you have anything that's truly sensitive, anything that an individual can take to the market and turn into dollars and therefore vulnerability or destruction of your market cap, never let one person handle the data. Have multiple parties that have to act on any piece of data. And this will slow you down a little bit, you have to invent new processes, but it's really important. You know, Max, I agree with most everything you've said. I'm going to take exception to that last point, and we might not disagree on it. We might actually see it similar. Uh, the problems on security are going to go up exponentially this, this year. Oh, yeah. If you thought last year was bad, go up exponentially. Uh, the rogue nation states, organized crimes, complexity, et cetera. Uh, every company will be broken into, every government will be broken into, that's a given. The question is, how do you know you're broken into, how do you remediate it, how do you handle it with your customers? As you think through it, uh, our studies show that uh, it, within nine hours, 60% of the data has been stolen that the perpetrator's after. Mm -hmm. The average company doesn't find it for four to six months. When you look at it, the average company including countries, has about anywhere from 40 to 60 security players in their environment, mm -hmm. which means you almost have none because right. the bad guys find the weakest spot. Mm -hmm. They just come right through it. Where I disagree with Max, and I could be wrong on this, is the data is going to have to be available throughout the entire network. The majority of, quote, big data uh, uh, computerization won't be at a central site mm -hmm. where you're going to deal with cancer. It's going to be at the edge in the retail store. It's going to be the edge at the mining site. It will be at the edge of a branch bank. It will be at the edge of a healthcare center in China. And most of the data, whether it's video, whether it's health data, et cetera, will not ever get transmitted to a central site. So you cannot necessarily encrypt it at the level that we want to get that security max. At least I don't think so, because you want to share that data for the patient to do the cost correlations. And the key is how do you give the patient the capability of opting out in a way that is constructive, even though the number of variables are going to be just huge in it. Yeah. So this is where it's going to take a lot of creative minds because government will step in and do something really stupid. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, if you think just one answer for security will be the answer, we're probably not true. We're going to bet a lot on becoming the number one security company, mainly because what Max said. There's 75 players in here. There is nobody over 5% share. It's got to be done architecturally. And the majority of security violations, the last one, mm -hmm. are errors where people didn't follow policy. That's how networks exactly get right. broken. I'll, 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 uh, I'll make one, one point. So I, I don't think we're disagreeing at all. I okay. think um, the, again, so I think uh, Robert tasked me with giving practical advice, and so I'll try to uh, stick to that plan. So one of the perversely good things about the fact that everyone's getting broken into, in fact, I'd bet you a dollar each that you've already been broken into. It's just the bad guys have to get it right once. We have to get it right every time. So right. it, it's, it's just bad news. But <laughs> the fact that now everyone's <laughs> on the same level, we're all... Don't you love that? I have to do an entrepreneur. <laughs> we just deal with that. How do we do it? I agree. <laughs> yeah, I just got to face the reality. So now that we face this reality, we basically have to say, look, yes, it's going to be vulnerability. It's never going to be black and white anymore. It used to be you've been broken into or not. Forget the not part. Now you have asked yourself the question, how much do you have to invest in protection and what is an acceptable level of vulnerability and what is an unacceptable level of vulnerability? My point about the centrally managed part, if you think of the value of your enterprise, as I certainly do, essentially as a function of data that you possess, 
then the spot in your enterprise that is most vulnerable is where most data is stored. As you go further and further out on the network, mm -hmm. the nuggets of data are fewer and far between, and therefore the vulnerability and the cost of breaking, being broken into goes down. The closer you get to the heart of the enterprise, the more you should be investing in that spot. Your protecting point. So that it's data. a gradient uh, type of methodology. Pierre, uh, you have a comment, and then I'm, we're going to open it up for questions for the last, call it 12 and a half minutes, please. Yeah, I just wanted to take the rebound from uh, John and, and Matt on this with uh, uh, maybe uh, two uh, additional uh, uh, comments. I mean, the first one, the world has changed. And probably two or three years ago, you had a kind of common wisdom that the benefit of the digital surpassed the security issues. And the compromise might have been more in favor of freedom, benefits, and then there might be some consequences, but you know, this is the nature of the internet. I think today, uh, what you uh, uh, mentioned, Matt, which is to put at the art of the design security at the art of it is the essence of what we have to do. So right. the compromise has probably moved, uh, right. uh, uh, and the balance, if you will, uh, has moved to something more balance between uh, safety and, and the benefits, uh, if you will. Uh, the second point is when we talk about data, we need to be now super specific mm -hmm. and to some extent super technical. I mean, you need to deal with data security. I mean, that's, that's the minimum. Right. My data are secured somewhere. Second, the data integrity. You can access my data, but you can't change it. Mm -hmm. Now, imagine if you can access my blood type, it might be highly beneficial. If you can access my blood type and change it, uh, it's a different story uh, by nature. So data integrity is a challenge in itself. And then you have the data privacy, which is something else. And all the techniques are going to move from encryption uh, or uh, going to move from uh, data aggregation, anonymization, and so forth. So all this data protection over landscape is getting more and more specific from a technology standpoint, but as well uh, from a society standpoint. And sometimes we're using data with a kind of confusion from privacy to security. I want my data secure, but I want my data to be used if there is a huge benefit. Right. Uh, if it's in healthcare, probably more on an anonymized way, uh, so you can uh, uh, predict some of my disease without not knowing my name. Mm -hmm. And we should do about data integrity. I mentioned the case, uh, which is uh, uh, pretty uh, uh, standard as well. Right. And you know, uh, we had and I had the opportunity to work in the EU Commission on the cloud and the, on data regulation, and we spent a lot of time in defining a charter for each of the three, the kind of SLAs, uh, service level agreement, you would need to provide. Uh, uh, and, and this is at this level, you now need to deal with data if you want all this big data to happen. Great, that, that's helpful. Let's do this. We have a few minutes for questions. Uh, questions, please stand up. We have mics in the, in the audience. One behind us, please. Let us know who you are. Yeah, my name is Gisbert Ruhl. I'm uh, the CEO of Klockner. Klockner is a steel distribution and service company. Uh, so as you can imagine, a very conservative industry. We started this process of digitalization one year ago. We did a lot of things. We have a strategy. We have a vision. We uh, uh, invented uh, a company in Berlin, uh, uh, an internet company. We are hiring people out of this industry. Uh, but I'm still always curious because I think we are, not, we are not fast enough. My people are saying to me, okay, we might be too fast. I think uh, we are not fast enough. So how fast should you be, or uh, uh, do you have to be in such a conservative industry to change the industry? I think we are, by the way, the front runner in the steel industry. And how, what can you do to be even faster? What, what, what uh, additional ideas you can- I'm collecting the hourly advice on this one. Transform uh, <laughs> a conservative <laughs> company. Yeah. Huh? Please, Pierre. Yeah, no, John, we, sure. yeah, you know, I don't know, I'm gonna provide some uh, yeah. free consulting, but it might not be- No, it's not free, I'll collect. <laughs> yeah, easier. So, uh, 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 but I, I guess all these questions is exactly, and by the way, uh, uh, I mean, German-driven organization, as you mentioned, John, are quite with the industrial intelligence for Dot zero. Berlin as well, you mentioned some of the countries where you can see some things happening. Very pleased you mentioned uh, France and other places, but of course Berlin uh, is, is, is trying to put things together in order to have the startups and a lot of creativity. I think it's all the question on where you're putting digital and many of the organizations, I, I had in mind uh, BBVA, we all know the, speci the Spanish bank. It's interesting to see uh, uh, how they are driving their digital agenda, how they are already deploying some of the 
on the already known digital capabilities into their organization. But uh, in parallel, they have set up quite a disruptive organization, totally dedicated, not to run the current digital, but to watch uh, the disruptors, like Matt uh, and the others. Uh, what it is they've been doing, creating venture fund to start investing in some startup related to their business and to try to figure out the what next, what might happen in the next uh, uh, 2010 or 20 years, uh, making some small and niche acquisition to learn. I think the way to move is how you deploying the current digital in your operation and how you anticipate the next move by learning, watching, seeding some business, creating some uh, venture fund. I think it's a it's an interesting illustration of a company having this kind of two-speed, what we're calling at Accenture, the kind of two-speed agenda, the current digital and the next gen. So just very quickly, understand the top three to five applications in manufacturing and process that you're going to get payback for. Do what you did, get people from the outside, because internal, you can't reinvent yourself on it. Uh, as a CEO, you've got to be the backer of it. You can never new, move too fast, except if you move without process or prioritization behind it. Next question, sir. Last comment, get Cisco and Accenture to do it for you. <laughs> Never miss an opportunity, Pierre. <laughs> but hire Max to get his point of view on how to break it. There's a plan that Pierre um, <laughs> was, um, was about to talk about the UVA. I, 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 I didn't know that, frankly. But um, as you know, we have uh, work on digitalization for many years. and. I think the, the banking system as a whole is, is under pressure. Most of the banks having addressed this uh, digital threat. My question is, um, on one hand you have the banks uh, having addressed properly the, the threat, but on the other hand you have the regulators. And most of the, the, the startups and, and companies working, working on specific parts of the, of the retail banking value chain are um, working as a, as a are para, 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 para tizing the infrastructure, the banking sector, but they don't want. They are not going into the into the arena where they can be regulated. They they stop from being regulated. You can see any any startup in the world, you know, going to the arena where the regulators can work or can you know can uh, put action put action on them. My question is, how do you see? the banking sector of the next five to years, providing that on the one hand you have a lot of people threatening, because the banks are not efficient, of course, but on the, on the other hand you have the regulators, you know, stopping them from you know, getting into the arena. How do you see? You know, yeah, Max, why don't you take that, because I think you know, Max has a very interesting uh, business that is actually in the banking industry, and I think he is disrupting the entire student loan industry at this point. But we, we will we will hear some more. It's a little strong. I'm disrupting the entire student loan industry, <laughs> but I'm definitely uh, on my way to disrupt uh, something. Um, I am working on a uh, on a banking startup. As a matter of fact, it's called a firm, and that's uh, that's my current full time job. Um, I, I agree with you. I think the regulatory pressures and regulatory difficulties are a defining narrative in the banking universe worldwide. I think. The way we found ourselves engaging with the regulators in the United States so far, we're just an American-focused company, has been actually quite rewarding. What we've done is we basically said, look, we are getting a lot of very, very interesting information at a much higher rate. One of the things that the banking industry has traditionally failed to do, because there's so much to lose, the, the fear and the, the terror, frankly, of getting yourself too far out on the limb of digitization is real. If you have a breach, you know, that's a good way to put yourself out of business if you have a couple hundred million customers. It's really scary. What we've done is said, look, we are a great place for very careful, very controlled experimentation. We bring to the regulator information about how consumers behave, how we behave vis-a-vis -vis consumers, how we interact with them, how we underwrite risk, how we take risks. To do this, to get the attention of the regulator, we have to go out there and actually take the risks. So a lot of the startups that skirt the true relationships with regulators and other banks say, well, we're going to ride the existing infrastructure and we're going to sort of disrupt it at the edges. I don't really think that's the correct path. I believe the correct path is to provide value and take the full risk associated with value creation. To address the regulatory requirements, you have to step in and say, we are the new kid on the block. We are going to take risk. We are going to learn on, on, on your time, but we're going to provide all the learnings and the risk associated with us is going to be a lot lower. 
I think for the banks that are, have existing customer bases, you have to carve out part of your organization and a product and products and then services, probably true for every company here, that where the cost of failure is lower, where you can bring to the regulators and to your partners a relationship where you say, look, here's an experiment. It's going to be important to find out what the outcome is, but it's not guaranteed protected. Great. Final part, we have, uh, let's do one more question and we're going to have a wrap up, please. Yeah. Hello, my name is Peter Nauta. I'm, the, um, I'm at Royal Philips in Amsterdam. I've, I like your quote about uh, thinking, uh, Max, about uh, how the other guy is going to put you out of business. Eh? So mm -hmm. you do that uh, every night or every other night. So I've got a question to John. So how do you apply that uh, to a very big and successful corporation like Cisco? You say disrupt or be disrupted, but how do you do that uh, in a practical sense? Uh, the speed of disruption is starting to become brutal. Uh, we made a decision that we have to reinvent ourselves every three to five years. We used to say five to seven, it's now three. Uh, you have to anticipate getting the market transitions right. You have to have the courage for yourself and your leaders to dramatically change. And if I were to give you the cliff notes, we've changed more in the last year than we've changed in any five years before. We completely changed our whole go-to-market. We completely changed our engineering organization services. We used to have 62 BUs that had profit and loss capability. The way you all buy is outcomes. So we got rid of 62 BUs, realigned 6,000 people, 70% of our engineering organization, and focused on outcomes. More simplistic customer base, software all the way through. You do the same thing with services and the same thing with sales. When you disrupt yourself, it's painful. You usually get penalized by the market. But if you don't disrupt yourself, you could put out a business to Max's point. And that's the hardest thing to do as a leader in today's environment. Your company does it very well, and you're always benchmarking in terms of what's possible. Let's do a rapid fire wrap up. Dr. Liu, please tell this audience what they need to do to ensure that they are embracing all the challenges of the digital economy the right way. Give us some advice. Uh, it's very hard. I think, you know, as IT, the people look at, look, look at us a uh, little bit fashion, and uh, we're doing everything digital. But uh, we, we have a big challenge because uh, digital technology is changing every day. So that gives uh, prices for the business uh, working for digital technology always have very short life. Mm -hmm. So we need to face those kind of challenge, always uh, curious and also to learning how to disrupt ourselves. So how to change ourselves, always to keep to learn. Max, final advice for their audience. Find disruptors in your organization, the ones that are thinking about leaving and starting their own business. Give them a platform internally where it's safe to fail and encourage them to disrupt yourself. John, you gave part of it. Any other advice for the rest of this audience? Yeah, we've, we've talked about thinking about first. I'm going to challenge the audience to think about last. Think about the last traffic jam you're ever going to see. Think about the last time anyone in the world can't get access to a doctor. Think about the last time you ever have to stand in a retail line. Think about the last time coming to Davos that you're never going to have to worry, did your bag get lost? <laughs> Think about when you download video, the last video disruption that occurs. This can change the world in a very unique way, but it requires all the comments that we talked about today. Pierre, the world will never be the same again, so you need to look to the future, and no company will have the capabilities to embrace the digital disruption. So you need to think about the strategic partnership Mm -hmm. You will have to create with the different partners in the ecosystem in order to enable your digital journey. My last piece of advice, buy more software. <laughs> <laughs> with that, thank you, panel. Really appreciate it. Thank you, your audience. You've been wonderful. <laughs>